Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the 2022 James D. Hopkins Memorial Lecture here at the Elizabeth Haub School of Law at Pace University. I am Haub Law Dean Horace Anderson, and I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining us here in the Moot Courtroom, as well as those uh, uh, connecting with us virtually. The title of James D. Hopkins Professor of Law is awarded to a member of the Haub Law faculty for a two-year term in recognition of outstanding scholarship and teaching. It was established with contributions from alumni and members of the legal community in honor of Judge James D. Hopkins, who was interim dean of the law school from 1982 to 1983. This designation is considered to be among the law school's most significant faculty honors. Since joining the faculty in 2009, Professor Noah Ben Asher has excelled in teaching torts, family law, and sexuality, gender, and the law. Their scholarship has been frequently published in prestigious journals, including the Tulane Law Review and the Columbia Journal of Gender and the Law. Previous to their role at Haub Law, Professor Ben Asher was in the Associate in Law Program at Columbia Law School from 2007 to 2009 and served as a Williams Fellow at UCLA School of Law, where they taught in the Department of LGBT Studies. From 2004 to 2005, they practiced in the Litigation Department of Proskauer Rose LLP in New York. Professor Ben Asher holds an LLM and a JSD from New York University School of Law and an LLB from Bar Ilan University School of Law. Professor Ben Asher has been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and at Columbia Law School. The Hopkins Chair is not Professor Ben Asher's only accolade at the law school. They have been the recipient of the Gotell Prize for Faculty Scholarship three times, 2013, 2017, and most recently in 2021 for their article, Trauma-Centered Social Justice, published in the Tulane Law Review. Law and sexuality is a field that is more important than ever as activists, employers, and governments continue to grapple with historic inequities and uneven protections based on gender, sexuality, and identity. We are privileged to have Professor Van Asher's leadership helping to drive important conversations and formulate new approaches to these critical issues. I'd now like to welcome Professor Van Asher to the podium to deliver the 2022 James D. Hopkins Memorial Lecture. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Dean Anderson for this lovely introduction. And thanks also to everyone who worked. Can you hear me in the back? Who worked uh, so hard to make this event happen. I am truly grateful and excited to be here. And I'm pleased to be joined here today by my mother, Holly. Yeah. <laughs> who, who flew from Israel to uh, attend this event, and also my sister, Sarla, and her partner, Amy, who came from Chicago to join us today. I also want to... <laughs> I also want to thank the amazing friends and colleagues sitting here uh, that I see all around me and also on Zoom. Uh, and who have talked about this project with me and pushed me to think about it harder and to be more clear and articulate about it. Finally, and most importantly, thank you, Margo, for helping me be my most honest self. Okay, so this project has been in the making for two decades. It starts for me with basic questions. What's gender? What's sexuality? What does it mean to be gay? These were critical questions for me in my 20s, a time when many of us, you may still remember, are trying to figure out who we are in the world. For me, in my early 20s, the story of Brandon and Tina was a turning point, an earthquake. How many of you have had the chance to view the film Boys Don't Cry? 
about the third quarter of the room. So in case you have not, this film captures the story of the life and death of a young person called Brandon Tina. It's a brutal story about a young female-bodied individual in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1993, who identifies and passes as a man, dates girls, and when his identity is revealed, two young men who had been his friends raped and murdered him on Christmas Day. When I first encountered Brandon's story, it struck me that he did not identify as a lesbian. In my understanding then, this is the 90s, sexual orientation was the determining factor of sexual identity. But something else was going on with Brandon. He challenged my understanding of gender and sexuality in his simple and honest understanding of his own life. He was not a girl, despite his female body. He was therefore not a lesbian in his own understanding. I realized that I must learn more about this distinction between gender and sexuality, about Brandon and about myself. And I've been learning since. So my talk today is about how legal sex has changed. By this, I mean the way in which in different areas of law, lawmakers, courts, and policymakers are shifting towards a new definition of legal sex, gender identity. When the county sheriff rudely asks Brandon after he is raped, and this is in a documentary film, I took that from a documentary film, and I'm quoting the sheriff, why do you round around with girls instead of guys, given that you are a girl yourself? End of quote. As if this should ever matter for a rape victim. Brandon says, and this is the important part, quote, I have a sexual identity crisis. And when he's pushed further by the sheriff, he says, quote, I don't know if I can even talk about it. Brandon, in 1993, did not have the vocabulary that someone in his position today would most likely have. Almost three decades have passed. And the 21-year-old Brandons of today would probably call themselves trans or non-binary. And there's a good chance they will not be murdered. But my story is not necessarily one of progress or redemption. That is not the type of stories I like to tell. My story at the most abstract level is about how gender and sexuality are mediated in our legal culture through medicine and science. It is a story about how medical ideas about gender changed over the last seven decades or so since the 1950s and about how those changes have translated into legal rights and recognition for people like Brandon. It is about how liberalism and rights have become entangled in science and medicine. And it is about the price tag that this entanglement comes with. So here's a brief roadmap for what I'll talk to you about. So first of all, I'll briefly describe the idea of how biological sex has changed from the end of the 19th century to about mid 20th century. Then I will offer a three-part taxonomy of how legal sex has changed accordingly. Then I will discuss briefly the current backlash against transgender people that we're currently in the midst of. And finally, I will offer my critique and suggestions regarding the future directions of legal sex. So let's start with the medical and, uh, medical and scientific definitions of sex. Uh, so, as you can see from this slide, which I actually really love, it's from the Sistine Chapel, uh, and it's the creation of Eve from the story of Genesis. Story about what we call the male-female binary go back millennia of human history. Look at this image, for example, from Michelangelo, in which God creates Eve out of a sleeping Adam's rib. This, of course, comes from the book of Genesis. So and I'm quoting here from Genesis, as uh, Dean Anderson told you, I went to bar Ilan University. So this is my moment. Uh, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep upon, to fall upon Adam, and Adam slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and said thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto man. This is from the King James Version. 
And so this is really a fascinating moment in which you know Eve, Eve comes out of the rib of Adam, and there's a lot we could say about you know how God is depicted here, how they are depicted here. Uh, but I won't go there. In modernity, we've been telling different stories about sexual differences and the male-female binary. No longer in the Garden of Eden, our authority has shifted with secularization from God and religion to medical science. One of the big differences in this new form of truth-telling about sexual difference is that it is not faith-based. It is subjected to testing, refuting, and experimenting. It is subjected to what one philosopher has called the, the test drive. Since late 19th century, medical experts studying the human body could not agree on one clear definition of biological sex. They began by focusing on gonads as the ultimate decider of true sex. Then they switched to focus on hormonal levels. And finally, they landed on what they called, what we call the sex gene. The problem for scientists was that humans come in different combinations of those characteristics. They don't always line up neatly, neatly along the male-female lines. The sexual binary became messy and fluid when doctors had more means to examine human bodies inside and out. Medical experts by mid 20th century agreed that we simply cannot divide humanity into only two types based on sex characteristics. The literature on this quest for the truth of biological sex is fascinating. Here are a few excellent examples of this slide in front of you, written mostly by historians of science and by feminists and queer theorists. That and that has informed my understanding of this matter. The gist of it, as I understand it, is that what we call the sex chromosomes appear in more variations than just XX or XY. There are combinations such as XXY or XO. And as for gonads, some individuals are born with both ovarian and testicular tissue. Hormonal measurements also vary in unpredictable ways. So the literature on the quest for true biological sex, which is vast and illuminating, and I encourage you to look at, kind of summarizes how the medical experts from the 19th century to mid 20th century shifted among these different indicators of biological sex. What historians agree on is that by mid 20th century, there was a crisis in definition, such that all these characteristics became part of what we call biological sex. And, this is where the idea of gender role and gender identity appears. At this point of crisis, when doctors could not figure out in the physical body that they were looking at, how to predict what a man and a woman is, or even how to define what a man and a woman is, gender identity emerged as a new, as a new category. It appeared in the United States at Johns Hopkins University, in research on intersex babies, and those are babies born with different characteristics, mixed characteristics or ambivalent characteristics of sex. And the basic idea was that one's inner understandings of one's sex is also a characteristic of the, of the sexual binary. So gender comes in as one more characteristic in that list of characteristics, chromosomes, genes, gonads. And in fact, the theory is promoted from the 1950s and on, is that it is the most important one predicting one's future adult self. So if you look at all of these characteristics, gender identity in childhood is the one that is most likely to predict where a person will end up as an adult. And this is, I'm just, for now, I'm summarizing the medical theories of sex researchers around 1950s all the way into the um, end of the, mid, of the 20th century. Gender became a more reliable predictor than the body. And that gender is in the inner self, in the inner mind. For those of you who are interested uh, kind of in the, in the philosophical question here, we see a flip between the mind and the body. Scientists couldn't figure out how the sex binary is defined in the human body, so they switched the focus to the human mind. So another way of saying this is that the true sex self was initially understood by medical experts to be in the gonads or the hormones or the genes by mid 20th century, it shifts to the mind, to the gendered mind. 
And if you're wondering how could this ever create any certainty about, about the future, the answer is complicated and it is found in the, in the research of one main leader in this field, which is John Money uh, in this slide in front of you. And John Money revolutionized this field by arguing that gender role is in the inner self. It is learned socially after birth. It is not predetermined. It is not biological. It can be shaped in early childhood. And for the consequence on for John Money was you can quote unquote fix the babies that are born the wrong way, which is with not clear indication on whether they're male or female. You can fix them by just giving them the gender identity you want and make their body match their mind that you gave them. That was the theory that John Money promoted. John Money has been a controversial figure. He has also been a great ally to transsexuals in the 1950s for these very same reasons. And the reason is the following. Once gender identity is established, according to this theory, it is immutable. So for adults, and the term transsexual emerges in the 1950s, he and others would say, well, the mind is gendered and it's fixed, it's, it's immutable, and so we ought to change the body accordingly, right? So the adult transsexual already has a gendered mind and we need to fix the body to make it match the, uh, the, the mind. Gender identity eventually becomes the leading medical indicator of sex. And with this concept in place, we see an emergence of transsexual identities from the 1950s and on. This is Christine Jorgensen. On December 1, 1952, the Daily News announced the quote unquote sex change surgery of Christine Jorgensen in a front page headline that read, XGI becomes blonde beauty, operations transform Bronx youth. Jorgensen became a media sensation. She opened the debate in mid-century America about visibility and mutability of sex. So here's Jorgensen. Christine Jorgensen, who used to answer to George, creates quite a stir as she returns home to New York from Copenhagen. Christine hit the headlines following the series of operations in Denmark that transformed her from a boy into a girl. Very impressed by everyone coming. Christine, I have to have been home. Yes, of course. What American wouldn't be? Have you been offered a movie contract? Yes, but I haven't accepted it. Do you uh, do you have any plans regarding the theater? No, I don't think so. Hey, Christine. Uh, are you going Christine. to go on with your photography? I hope so, yes. I see. Right. I'm okay, very happy quiet. to be back, and I don't have any plans at the moment. And I thank you all for coming, but I think it's too much. Well, I love this part. Thank you all for coming, but I think it's too much. Go over and over to that line, what is too much, right? So, uh, Jorgensen's story became a central event in the reconceptualizing of sex, gender, and sexuality that would follow for the rest of the 20th century. The idea that biological sex is mutable, that we can divide it into smaller parts, chromosomes, hormones, genitals, that masculinity and femininity do not stem directly from biology that neither sex nor, nor gender determines sexual desire. All of these ideas were new and they caused excitement and debate in the medical world, the legal world and the art world. Here are two images from photographer Nan Golden whose art documents the lives of her close friends in Boston in the 1970s. Part two, how legal sex came. So historians of science and feminist theories have told these stories already about the origins of gender identity and the new understandings about sex and gender and sexuality that emerge around the 20th century. So what do I have to add? My story is about how 
legal sex change and how medical expertise has played a key role in this change. So here's my taxonomy. And for those of you who know my work and have talked to me, I love taxonomies. That's how I think, that's how I operate. So I came up with three main eras uh, in, in which I see a different treatment of legal sex. Now, what do I mean by legal sex? I mean, all the instances in which lawmakers, policymakers, courts, legislators have to decide what is a man and what is a woman and what is the definition of, of, of the of sexual difference. So with the wonderful help of research assistants, and I see especially one sitting right in front of me, thank you. I have looked at hopefully most or all relevant cases from the end of the 19th century to this day, where lawmakers or policymakers have had to define legal sex. And I suggest that legal sex can be divided roughly into three eras. In the first era, self is in the body, right? So biological sex is defined in the legal world as something, something in the physical body. The two test cases that I look at are female husbands and cross-dressing prohibition. So I examined cases of female husbands following the lead of a recent book by Jen Manion, uh, in which female-bodied individuals married women and became their husbands. And this is 19th century America and Britain. They passed as men until they were revealed. And in these police reports that I get mostly from newspaper, old newspaper clips, we see courts and the police treating these female husbands as women upon discovery of the great deceit. In most of these cases, their marriages would be annulled which means no longer valid. Uh, and they would be subjected to criminal charges for cross-dressing. Right? This is all the way up from mid from 19th century to mid 20th century, we see these cases. In this era as well, in that we have much more legal documentation about, we have cross-dressing prohibitions in big cities like San Francisco uh, and some states also in which it would be a crime to cross-dress, to, to wear the, dead, the, the clothes from uh, the opposite sex. And these violators were treated purely based on their physical body, male or female. So what I make of this is that we have, uh, during the time that medical experts define sex as somewhere in the body, we also see a correlation in the legal treatment of sex. No big surprise. It is you're either a man or a woman, and you know that from looking at your body, right? To quote Tina Fey, gender identity is not a thing yet, right? Only the latter is quoting Tina Fey, right? Not a thing, not so it's all in the body. The second part in, in my taxonomy, and this is where things get interesting, as you know, my art is in text, the mind-body harmonization era. So from 1960 to 2000, we see a bunch of court cases uh, where uh, where courts have to decide what is this person in front of me? Is it a man or a woman? So this happens in sex reclassification cases when people come to court and say, I want to change my documents, I want to change my birth certificate, my passport. It comes in marriage annulment cases where someone wants to end a marriage and says, well, I'm actually married to a man and, and you know, and same-sex marriage is prohibited. And we see it in anti-discrimination claims where transgender people or gender non-conforming people come to court and say, this is sex discrimination. And so courts have to say, you know, is this a man or a woman? And they have to define. What's really cool and interesting about these cases is that we see kind of a mind-body harmonization approach from the 1960s to 2000, in which basically what courts are saying is, look, if your body can be fixed to match your gender identity, we will treat you according to the alignment. So if you identify as a man and you have gone through gender affirming care, then we will call you a man. In some cases, obviously, it's not a neat, uh, there are always exceptions, but it's a trend that we're seeing in those years towards understanding gender identity as part, as an important component in, in one's legal sex. And this happens from the 60s to the end of, of the century. In the 21st century, something more uh, interesting happened. In this era, I call this the self and the mind era. And here we see, which and this starts around the 2000s, early 2000s, and we see cases at, starting with progressive cities and municipalities like San Francisco and New York, 
where the primary indicator of legal sex becomes gender identity, right? Uh, without any need to change the body. By 2022, you are seeing this all over in your lives, in your legal and non-legal uh, non lives. Ex examples would include, for example, when we ask our students to identify their gender pronouns, when we ask our colleagues and friends to identify their gender pronouns, the legal categories, uh, so this is kind of an social life, but in the legal world, I'm seeing this phenomenon most clearly and explicitly in new sex reclassification laws that no longer require any change in the body, uh, and also in Title IX cases involving high school st students and college students, and also in some, in a large number of Title VII cases, uh, especially after the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock, but also before it. So there is a trend here that I call the self in the mind in which there's no longer a need for harmonization with the body because now gender identity is what I call the new sex. Backlash. With this trajectory in mind, it should not surprise anyone that there is a resistance to this growing recognition of gender identity as a primary classification of sex. It's no surprise that since 2018, there is massive wave of legislation and policy attempting to halt this exact phenomenon that I am describing. We see bans on gender affirming care for minors in states like Texas and Arkansas. We see bans on participation in sports team and the list is long. These initiatives are tracked closely in the ACLU website, as well as, as well as other transgender advocacy organizations. Sex has changed, medical understanding and social understanding of sex have changed, and now legal understanding of sex has changed. I want you to see this short clip from John Stewart interviewing the Attorney General of Arkansas. You will see that he wants to understand what is driving her state ban, total ban on gender affirming care for minors. This will be a, a four minute clip, so I warn you. And you're allowed to laugh because this is John Stewart. Why would the state of Arkansas step in to override parents, physicians, psychiatrists, endocrinologists who have developed guidelines? Why would you override those guidelines? Well, I think it's important that all of those physicians, all of those experts, for every single one of them, there's an expert that says we don't need to allow children to be able to take those medications, that there are many instances right. where... But you know that's not true. You, you know it's not for everyone there's one. There's These are the established... Well, I don't know that, that that's not true. I don't know that... Then why, you would know you, that. why would you pass a law then if you don't? If you don't know that that's true, wouldn't you? Well, I know so? that there are doctors and that we had plenty of people come and testify before our legislature mm -hmm. who said that, uh, you know, we have 98% of the young people who have gender dysphoria, right. uh, that they are able to move past that. And once they have the, the help that they need, no longer suffer from gender dysphoria. 98% wow. without uh, that medical treatment. That's that, that's and an so, incredibly made up figure. That's That doesn't comport with any of the studies or documentation that exists from these medical organizations. What what medical association are you talking about of these doctors? Well, we have all of that in our uh, legislative history and we'll be glad to provide that to you. Uh, I don't have the name of that off the top of my head. I know it's something that- You don't have the name of the organization that-, that Off you're the top of my head. Oh, okay. But yes, we have all of that cited in all of our briefs. You're suggesting that protecting children means overriding the recommendations of the American Medical Association, the American Association of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough to show that these drugs are effective and that these children are better off and that we should we don't encourage have enough, these. Or it's not enough for you. Let, let, me, let me try and flip it a different way and see if maybe this, this can help. In Arkansas, if you have pediatric cancer, and obviously we all want to protect children, I think we established that earlier, whose guidelines do you follow for pediatric cancer? Well, I think if my child, who is four, if I was faced with that terrible uh, 
decision, then I would be speaking to my doctor. And if my doctor recommended something that I disagreed with, then I would get a second opinion. And that's what I believe that these parents need to make sure that they're encouraged to get numerous opinions when they're talking about an irreversible step. You're not letting them. Can. The state's not saying get another opinion. What they're saying is you can't. What you're actually saying no, is the opposite. No, that's actually not at all what the state said. The state simply said that you cannot perform these procedures. And so parents should get another opinion that they, and children should want to have another opinion. But that's not. Because again, these are nine, 10, 11, So if your child years. is suffering from pediatric cancer and the state comes in and says to you, they recommend chemotherapy, but we're not going to let you do that. You can't. We think you should get a different opinion. And here's the organization we think you should get the opinion from. They're not the mainstream, but they're an organization. So that's how you, that's who you have to be treated by. Does that sound like something you would Well, accept? I think that's a very extreme example. That's not at all in line with what we're talking about. We're not saying that at some point, because when you have cancer, it literally is, and particularly pediatric cancer and having friends that have lost children sure. to pediatric cancer, having a four-year-old, I'm sure. I've got some bad news for you. Parents with children who have gender dysphoria have lost children. This is chain leads me to the final part of my talk. Two important points come out of this interview. And I encourage you to watch the full interview on Apple Plus. John Stewart is relying on medical experts to support gender affirming care for minors. He is, her, or he is urging the attorney general to see that without this care, there is a high level of youth suicide due to gender dysphoria. The AG is rejecting the medical expertise. And what underlies her resistance is that she and many others view transgenderism and homosexuality as bad social outcomes. An outcome that you may have to tolerate in adults given the last decades of legal advances from Lawrence versus Texas and on, but you do not want in, keep in kids. They're using all the legal tools at their disposal to prevent and reduce the number of future transgender adults. The heavy reliance of gender identity advocates on medical science has been productive for the rights and recognition of gender minority, but it has come to cost. And my concern is that by over relying on medical science and expertise as John Stewart just performed for us, we do not engage in the debate on sexual morals as, as it is emerging in front of our eyes. We don't engage the Leslie Rutledge's and the Tucker Carlson's of the world with what is really going on. They don't want us to exist. Let me be clear. In the context of sex and gender, I'm asking the following question. Is it good outcome to have gay people? Is it better outcome to have straight people? Should we, should we raise our children to be gay? Should we raise them to be straight? Should we raise them to be cisgender? Should we raise them to be transgender? The question is true for parents, but it is also these days a question for state laws and legislatures and public schools. The debate is in the domain of sexual morality, no matter where you fall on it. Namely, if you are a pro-trans advocate like I am, I would say trans is as good a social outcome as cisgender. If you're not, you'd say that trans is not a good social outcome, but we should tolerate it or not. In any event, the debate, I think, is in the domain of sexual morals and not only in the domain of medical science. What's at stake today is not whether existing transgender adults ought to be affirmed, tolerated, or granted equality, dignity, and empathy. Of course they should. But whether society desires the existence of future transgender children and adults. The answer should be an unequivocal yes. Anything less, to quote Eve Sedgwick, quote, is necessarily destined to turn into either trivializing apologetics or much worse, a silkily camouflaged complicity in oppression, end of quote. Let me end with a note that I hope will resonate with this audience today. Last year, when I finally gathered the courage to write this piece, I found a big poster of Brandon Tina, framed it, and hung it in my office. I want my students and colleagues to ask me about him, I want them to realize by looking at his face that when we talk about gender and sexuality, we are in the domain of morality, life, and death. 
which we must approach not with pride, certainty, and silence, but with humility, empathy, and kindness. Thank you, and I look forward to your thoughts. So my question for you is, do you see that um, the gender identity about which you speak is going to take the same trajectory as homosexuality has in our society? So, so thanks for this question. Uh, it definitely led, has, yes, yes, I, it has definitely led my insight on, on these issues. And one of the facts that blew my mind more, more than anything on this point is that in the very same year that homosexuality was taken out of the psychiatric disorder book, a new diagnosis came in. And that's gender identity disorder. So it's not only that I think it's theoretical, I think it's actual. We needed a psychiatric disorder. And once we realized we had to tolerate adult homosexuals, because it was already the 80s and there was a lot of political lobbying around this, it was the HIV years, uh, gender identity became the problem. Uh, and I think this is fascinating. And I think we are now in the kind of the, in the, kind of the culmination of gender identity being the problem. John Money. Yes. And then you know, now, this is really um, similar to the questions uh, that I've been asking about this one, but they seem like this is compatible with what the Christian heritage is talking about. So, that was just so sad for the last time. There's a lot of changes in the childhood, but then when you get down, okay, I thought, well, it's just a lot of people. But I don't see where it is exactly right now. So, I need to have some. Basically, the the value of um, expressing oneself in this kind of honesty affects both the sci the the science because right there's of course interdependence between science and values and then the legal side of things. Wow. Uh, yes. So, so I just want to make sure you're asking if if the expression part on adult part or the or the children's part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Right. So it's really hard to answer it because it really would depend on, on who you ask, right? Uh, in, in kind of, if you go to the clinical literature, and this is why I find it so fascinating to go back and forth to look at the clinical literature and then to look at, you know, how it manifests in courts. If you go to the clinical literature, then there's no difference there, right? You are who you are and you're born. And the, the way that the Ninth Circuit cases go, the way that the Ninth, Title IX cases that are now going is, you know, Ash is this, you know, he's, he's a transgender boy suing uh, his school. He was always like this. He was born like this. In utero, he was also 
he was already like this. So his expression and his gender identity for this new idea is, is one, right? We express who we are and we are that early on. Uh, and that definitely then leads to a lot of good outcomes for transgender youth and adults because the courts and the and policymakers and medical experts support that, that gender identity. Now notice that I'm only talking about medical um, uh, uh, discourse and I'm talking about legal discourse. I'm not telling you what I think uh, because what I think is that we are uh, we're making, we're using a lot of languages, we're trying to put them together, and I think human beings are much more complicated than the, than the way that the medical experts and the legal experts and the advocates are putting it together. How are you doing, Professor? Um, with the uh, presentation that you get, just gave and with just our interpretations of gender in general, we're still currently moving along the binary of this side is men, this side is women, and we're just beginning to include people who identify as things in between and characteristics from both. Do you ever see along the line further in the future us moving past the concept of just, it's just the binary and within the spectrum of the binary and just opening it up to gender and identity and what you identify as, and even sex can be beyond just these two things or something in between uh, and go beyond even just that spectrum itself. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for this question. Uh, the uh, criti critical feminists and queer theorists have been for years, and I'm included there, lamenting the fact that we are stuck in, in binaries. Uh, and the good news from the last, I would say 10 years, is that non-binary identities and politics and advocacy in literature uh, is emerging such that law is changing. And if you look at current uh, current uh, sex classification rules, we have current rules from New York, I think even US passport, you can identify as non-binary and it is entering into a, a different domain such that we are moving away from the male female binary. There is a shift and I think we're in the midst of that as well. I know, <clears throat> tremendous paper. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, but this paper really underscores my question for you. So during that period, that second period, the mind-body melding kind of period, was also a time when it was discovered that medical science had been ignoring women in a wholesale and extremely deleterious way, that biomedical research was completely focused and predicated on the 70 kilogram white man, race was also uh, excluded. And as a result, medical care was abysmally deficient, misguided, many, many people who were excluded from the traditional biomedical research protocols suffered and died. So it was also a life and death issue. And that, and that continues to this day. The medical literature continues to find that there are such distinct, when it, you talk about cardiac care, identification of syndromes, et cetera, et cetera. So we now have in law, as a result of what some of us fought very hard to do, regulations and requirements that protocols must include and accommodate and identify by gender and by race, subpopulations and do completely independent analysis of the impact of drugs or the impact of interventions, et cetera, that identifies that acknowledges that there are different consequences and that that has to be taught in medical schools and so forth and so forth. This seems to me on a collision course to some extent with your analysis which, but that's why I wanna ask you to say, is there a way to reconcile on the one hand, what some would view as substantial progress in biomedical research, acknowledging the reality of difference and, uh, and, and the thesis that you're advancing yeah. here. Thanks, Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks. So I absolutely agree that the treatment and the, the, the misogyny around how the medical health professions has treated women and still does matters a lot. 
I don't think it's in a collision course with my thesis. In fact, I think it supports my thesis. And, and here's why. What blew my mind and still blows my mind about how this idea of gender identity came about, this idea that, by the way, Ruth Gader Ginsburg made a, a whole career with, right, with gender stereotyping, and we, my students and I talk about it all the time. It came from the medical experimentation on bodies that looks a lot like eugenics when we think about what they did to intersex babies in the 50s, right, and, and, and all the way through. Right? So what was the goal of experimenting on those bodies? It was to create perfect heterosexual subjects. Right? It was to create a body that would look heterosexual such that we could maintain the patriarchy and the heterosexual existence. So your story and my story fit perfectly well. On the politics of it, what do we do with the fact that now trans people want to be identified according to their gender, uh, to, to, to their gender identity? I think it contradicts the health records. I think we could make exceptions in health records to say my assigned birth at, at my, my sex assigned at birth is X, and now I identify as that, and here's how it fit into the medical agenda, right? So I think it works well. I'm not saying that we should just abolish all sex categories, because I don't think that would work, and I don't think it's where we are. Does that make sense? Hi, I'm, I'm James, and I have a question that kind of follows from that. It's more of a general curiosity question. We've seen, um, you know, not even just in recent current events or anything like that, but there's been this trend in the judiciary of more and more involvement in political questions, uh, which is a shift in doctrine, and also more involvement in moral concerns in the past. So I was just curious if you would uh, take the opportunity to like, flesh that out, and maybe that was like what you were getting at at the end of your previous answers to the question. Yeah. So uh, um, I, I hear the question to be about the current politicizing of the federal judiciary, right? Uh, yes, on which you know my family law students have to be subjected to, to this, my ideas about this twice a week. My, my, my answer on that would be, of course, we are in a time when politics and law are, are <laughs> hard to distinguish. I personally believe we have never been in other times. I think politics was always part of the law. The current judiciary is willing to engage the culture wars more heads on, uh, which I think makes my point even more urgent, which is, and this is why I showed Tucker Carlson and the Attorney General of Arkansas. The question is not really about medical science for, for the conservative part of the culture wars. It's really about going back to a certain idea of patriarchy, of white male patriarchy, that's the conservative agenda, and it is manifested pretty clearly in, for example, the recent Dobbins decision. Uh, and so, uh, so I think we must confront it head on. Okay. Um, thanks for your talk today. It's very informative. Um, my question is, where do state legislatures, such as the state of Arkansas, um, grasp at the straws for this authority to um, place restrictions on gender affirming, um, gender confirming um, surgeries, when we've seen in so many cases in your family law class how um, there is a liberty interest of parents in order to parent their children in the best interest of those children. And so where do these state legislatures um, get that authority or, or infer that authority that they have a greater interest uh, than the parents? Oh, great. I, I feel so proud as your professor. <laughs> so we learn in, in family law from uh, from the earlier Supreme Court cases in the 1920s and on that there is a liberty interest in the, direct, in the upbringing of children. We go all the way to the Supreme Court in Troxel in 2000 where we understand that there is, the rule is that parents are best understood to have the best interest of their children in mind. And in exceptional cases, the state will step in. That is not happening, right? So what is happening and it's more, it's even more severe in Texas. Uh, where Governor Abbott said, basically, if you affirm your child's gender, we will separate those families. We will take children away from families who affirm their children's gender, right? And it's not only about surgeries. So minors hardly ever go undergo third surgeries. Last I looked, there are no surgeries for minors. We're talking about either affirming one's gender at home, coming out to the school, affirming your child's gender, 
uh, at, at most puberty blockers, which are understood to be reversible, right? And so, and that's why there are immediate challenges by the ACLU and other organizations that challenge the parents who support their children. You had a, a couple of questions that struck me. Um, you said, is it good? Is it a good outcome to have people gay? Is it better to have straight people? Um, those seem, those questions seem to have like a, like a social utility context to them. Um, how do you like feel about identity as um, social utility? Can you explain what you mean by social utility? Yeah, like, is it a good outcome? Like, is it a good outcome for like, I'm guessing that you meant like society or um, like, do you see any problems with identifying like by using identity as a, like a, in the context of social utility? Great. So when I said, is it a good outcome or is it a bad, out a bad outcome? I actually meant to provoke you, right? Because my approach at least is that we have no idea what is good or bad. And we're trying to use different theories to identify the good and the bad. So that's why I asked you to define utilitarianism. You could come up with the utilitarian, utilitarian approach in which gay is better than straight because you know we're overpopulating the, the planet. So maybe it's good to have less people or no people at all, right? Uh, or, so you see what I'm saying? It really depends on the approach that you have to what is good and bad. But whatever that approach is, I want to, I want to urge us to see that we cannot keep relying on the medical experts to give us those answers. We need other ways to think about it. Okay, I'll talk loudly. Oh, wait, there you go. Um, so you brought up social, uh, excuse me, like gender morality and sexual morality. And it got me thinking, um, you brought up uh, patriarchal like in, in implications into like this divide and, um, it made me think about uh, how well, do you think it is accomplished? It, 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 this can be accomplished with how severe the religious implications of morality are, even currently in, in, in precedents in Supreme Courts, reading like Scalia's opinions and, su and such, how, how um, feverishly he implicates morals and attaches that to religion. Do you think um, as a country, we will have to start separating ourselves like religiously in order to um, accept gender, uh, this gender spectrum or encourage it, I guess. Great, I'm so, I'm really happy for this question and I'm looking back for the slide, which I think is a good match for your question, which is the Garden of Eden. Right, that's right, that's, that's right, right. right. Uh, and so ideally, it, it's quite possible that Sam Alito might prefer this version of sex distinction in which, if you look at God pretty carefully here, he actually looks like a surgeon, right? He's a surgeon and he's performing surgery on the rib and then comes out and one of one, the patient is under anesthesia actually. Uh, and, and so is this the version of, of morality that we're up against? Extreme originalism, let's say, right? Uh, all I could say is perhaps, Perhaps that's what we're up against, but I'm not scared, right? If that's the story they want to tell, that's the story they tell, we tell other stories. Good afternoon. So I find your lecture to be very serendipitous to a discussion I was actually having with somebody today. Uh, we were talking about Jon Stewart and everything, and we were actually hypothesizing that uh, me being from Texas, this is a discussion that gets very fierce. And it seems that most individuals, their decisions and their feelings are informed by a week or two that they may have spent in high school based on chromosomal education. And so we were, we were thinking, and do you think like as many of us go on to be advocates perhaps uh, for the cause of LGBTQ plus justice, that perhaps one of the biggest battlegrounds may be in State Department of Education standards. You think perhaps that uh, if educational standards can reflect proper guidance to perhaps quash um, misconceptions about medical science, mm -hmm. that perhaps that may serve 
justice overall. Absolutely. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. And I think, again, the conservatives are one step ahead of us. So they've already banned that alongside critical race studies, right? Uh, and so, yes, so I'm talking specifically about, about uh, like a legislation like Don't Say Gay in Florida, right? Where, yes, we should be educating and yes, we should be educating early, as early as toddlers, right? That there are variations on sexuality and gender. Uh, but every but but the other side knows that too, and so so I think that's where the game is. We need to educate. Thank you. Get elected to school boards, everybody. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm intrigued by your questions at the end, uh, the questions about equivalency in terms of social outcomes, and the questions actually made me think again about the Christine Jorgensen clip where she's landing at Idlewild Airport, which is now JFK, so a big airport. Um, and she's greeted the way I perceive and the way I think I've seen on film, Marilyn Monroe get greeted at an airport, Grace Kelly get greeted, greeted at an airport. Um, and so I wonder if at least in that moment, right, in that moment, that group understood that um, uh, cisgender and transgender could produce equally socially good outcomes, right? Because they were asking her about um, whether she wanted a film contract, is she gonna become a model? Again, this is all, it was shocking actually for me to, to watch that clip and hear the music that was playing behind it. Like I said, very Grace Kelly, very Marilyn Monroe. So my question for you is in your research, did you find out more about how Jorgensen lived after returning from um, the surgery, and are there any lessons we can learn from that moment in terms of having the answer to your questions about equivalency be yes in 2021 when they were seen to be yes in that moment in 1951? Yeah, so that's fascinating. And I, I went to the clip uh, and I share your views on how glamorous she is. And she was really a celebrity and she went on to Hollywood and she started a big club in New York. She was a celebrity for the rest of her life. And here, the book, How Sex Changed, that I have in this, uh, uh, written by a historian Joanne Mayorovitz and published in Harvard University Press around 2001 or two, follows her story. So basically uses Jorgensen's story as a way to lead us through how sex changed. It's called How Sex Changed. Uh, through the 20th century, how her influence, what happens is that she goes on and she meets John Money and, and, the, and, the, and the people who are, Harry Benjamin, who are defining transsexuality. She becomes an advocate trans, for transsexuality and it's really a poster figure for, for this new idea that sex is mutable. And of course it helps that she's glamorous and beautiful and, uh, and she carries all that. <laughs>